It is my privilege to be here tonight and to have this opportunity to present this two-part seminar on the subject of a recent book that has been published <clears throat> called New Wine and the Babylonian Vine, subtitled Last Day's Delusion in the Name of Christ. Over the past decade, as I've had the opportunity to travel to many different places around the world, I noticed that there was another great threat to Christianity, and that was Christianity that was embracing extra-biblical teachings, extra-biblical revelation. And although I had no intention to go down this particular road as I made observation, I was compelled to do so. And in the past, we've written a couple of small books on this subject, and this is the third in the series, which turned out to be more than actually a small book. And so tonight we want to present this information to you in PowerPoint format that will be video recorded. New Wine, The Babylonian Vine, Last Day's Delusion in the Name of Christ. Will the monitor come on? Thank you. As I mentioned, this particular subject is, I believe, very important but very controversial. And if you're here tonight, I want you to test everything that I say with the Bible. Because there may be things that I say tonight that you may not agree with. And so the final authority should not be what I am proclaiming but what God has said. And the Bible, I believe, warns us that in the last days, there will be a time of great deception. It's actually called delusion. And that many will be deceived in the name of Christ. And tonight we want to examine some of the trends that are taking place in our society that are occurring within the name of Christianity. And we're going to be looking at how these things that are taking place can be understood in light of Scripture. And that's what we want to do, is we want to lay down a foundation, first of all, from Scripture. And we begin with 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, verses 3 to 4, where Paul was warning the church at Corinth. He was concerned. He was troubled. And he said, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. A very interesting and significant portion of Scripture in which Paul is making some clear statements. First of all, he says the gospel is simple. What is the gospel? It's believing in who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. It's recognizing who we are and what we have done, sinners, and asking God to forgive us and repent. It's very simple. But somehow it would seem that the Corinthians had made it complex or they had added some additional ideas or beliefs to the gospel. And he said there was a concern because, as you know, there's a deceiver, the master deceiver, Satan, the dragon, the devil, the one who has deceived the whole world, has an agenda. And he said, as Eve was deceived by the serpent, so you too, he said, have been deceived. And you've left the simple gospel for another gospel. See, the Bible says there is another gospel, a counterfeit gospel. And this is a dangerous gospel because it is authored by another spirit. And Paul continued to say, there is another Christ. So another gospel, another spirit, and another Christ. 
And I believe that he's exhorting them. Get back to the gospel, the true gospel. He spoke to the Galatians in the same way. He said, there's another gospel. And he said to them, who has bewitched you? These were genuine, sincere believers who believed that they were believing the truth, but they had been deceived into believing a lie. And throughout the Bible, we see that there is an author of deception. Satan, the dragon, the devil, the one who deceives the whole world. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12, we read, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, there's a battle going on. And many times we think this battle is with people because it's right up close. But Paul is telling us that behind the scenes, in another dimension, we can't see it with our eyes, but it's real. And human beings are actually pawns that play a role in this deception. And what is even more troubling is that Christians, that is, those who have placed their trust in Jesus Christ, who believe in him, can also play a role in the deception if they do not live according to this book, God's will. Deception is authored by, the Bible says, the dragon, the devil, the serpent, the one who deceiveth the whole world. In Revelation 12, 9, it says he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This is future. It hasn't happened. But right now, this deception is underway, and it has been underway since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. And you cannot understand history unless you understand that God has an adversary, Satan. And he has a plan. He has an agenda. And as we're going to see in the last days, Satan's agenda is to deceive the world in the name of the Savior, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at these scriptures which show us that this is what the Bible says. Earlier today I was speaking at a Bible school and I was presenting Satan's agenda and deception and how he deceives. Number one, I believe that he's deluded people worldwide because they don't believe that God is the creator. They believe in evolution. Number two, many people worldwide, billions of people, don't believe in the God of the Bible because they believe that everything is God. The New Age, Eastern religion. And thirdly, I made the statement that in the last days we can expect the greatest deception in the history of the world will take place and the world will be deceived in the name of Christ. And one of the students said, I don't agree. I don't think that's fair. I don't think God would allow the world to be deceived. And so I read the scriptures. Don't accept what I am saying, but check out what God has said. Because the scriptures are full of references regarding this deception. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8-9. to nine, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. There's an agenda. He has a plan. And this plan is to deceive unbelievers, but also to blind the minds of believers. And if believers are not willing to believe all that God has said, then they are subject to deception. We all are. We're all subject to deception. 
And so it's important that we pay careful attention to God's revelation given to us in his word. Because Satan's objective is to take as many people hostage with him to hell. And Christians, as we said, can play a role in this deception. And as we're going to see, the Bible says that in the last days, people who believed... Now, don't believe. That is, there's an apostasy. There's a falling away from the faith. They once believed, but now they believe in something else. They have a faith, but it's not the faith based on the word. Now, turn with me to Matthew in chapter 24, because we need to look at the words of Jesus regarding this subject. Jesus was asked by his disciples what it would be like at the end of the age. Verse 3, and as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Jesus said many would be deceived by many. And then there are other references to deception. In verse 11, and many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. In verse 23, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, Do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders. So as to mislead, if possible, even the elect, behold, I told you in advance. Bible prophecy is knowing the future before it happens. And of course, we don't know everything about the future before it happens, but God has seen fit to reveal to us certain things that have been recorded in his word. And when we study Bible prophecy, we know that Bible prophecy has either already been fulfilled, is in the process of being fulfilled, or it will be fulfilled with 100% accuracy. So, in relation to this subject matter, when Jesus said, Beware of deception, many will be deceived by many, many false teachers, many false prophets, many lying signs and wonders. I've told you in advance, you can believe it. Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. So we have been warned in advance about these false teachings, false prophets, lying signs and wonders. Why? So... When they take place, we can, well, the the scripture said that would happen. You see, that builds up faith. Faith in the word of God. When God makes statements and then these statements are fulfilled, it builds faith. The right kind of faith. Faith in God. Faith in his word. We're warned about a time where there would be these false Christs. It states in verse 20. Seven, for just as a lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 26 is stated, If therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe. You see, there's going to come this time when they're going to say, The Christ is here, or the Christ is there. And tonight I'm going to be showing you That we are living in such a day. The signs of the times are being fulfilled right now. And Jesus said, when these signs unfold, I'm coming soon. This is a serious matter. In Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, Again, that many would stand before him on judgment day and they would believe that they were going to heaven. Notice what it says, beginning verse 21. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. Now think of this. Every time I read this, I cannot help but think what it's going to be like. Many people, not a few, many, standing before the Lord, they believe they're on their way to heaven, and Jesus says to them, Depart from me, you who practice iniquity. You see, they'd experienced the miraculous in Jesus' name. They believed there were Christians. But they hadn't understood the simple gospel. They had embraced another gospel. And because of this, they spend eternity in hell. That's why this is such a serious matter. And that's why we need to pay attention. Peter says, you do well to pay attention when God reveals to you events regarding the future, we have a more sure word of prophecy. In 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, the third and fourth verse, Paul writes about this time of deception. He says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see, there's a time coming, and it doesn't seem like it's that far away as we see these signs unfold, that a man someday will proclaim his divinity, and he will say, this man will say, I am God. But before that happens, there has to come this time. It's called a falling away, an apostasy. And that's a reference to a time when people who once believed now don't believe what they believed. They once believed the Word of God, but now they have added something to the Word of God. Or they have embraced things that are not in the Word of God that others believe that are godly. And they have a faith but it's not the faith based on the word. So this, again, is another indication from the scriptures, not only what Jesus said, but Paul stated this. And in the ninth to the 11th verses of the same chapter, he continues, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth. What is the truth? Jesus said, thy word. Thy word is true. That they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should not, or they should believe the lie. I chose purposely to use this word. Initially, I had used last day's deception in the name of Christ. And then one day, going through the scriptures, it says delusion. That's strong deception. And this is why so many will be deceived. Now, there are those who say, Let us just agree to disagree. But as I read through the Bible, I find that there are many examples 
in Scripture where we are to contend for the faith. In the book of Jude, third verse, Jude writes, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write about our common salvation. Now this is interesting. Jude was writing this letter and he was making every effort to write about salvation. Our common salvation. He wanted to write to them about Jesus. Our salvation is in Jesus. In Jesus alone. But he had to change his plans. Why? Because he said, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And then it continues in the next verse, verse 4, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now this was happening, of course, in this time. But, as you know, the scriptures reveal to us that things often repeat themselves. And Satan really doesn't have any new tricks. And I would contend that we are facing exactly what Jude was talking about. And I would suggest to you that the Bible states, not just in this portion of Scripture, but in numerous portions of Scripture, and we'll conclude this evening with some of them, that if we know the truth based on the Word of God, we must tell others. Contending is not passive. Contending requires action. And if you're going to contend for the faith, you must have faith. Faith in the Word. You must know what the Word says. And how do you get faith? By hearing the Word. Studying the Word. And in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, yes, this is Old Testament, but there's a principle here. God called Ezekiel. And he said, Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to serve, to save his life. That same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, <coughs> but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So there's a principle here that when God reveals truth to us, I think that it's not just for Ezekiel. I think that because the New Testament challenges us to contend for the faith, yes, this principle is also a New Testament principle. Because if people are deceived and we allow them to carry on without sharing the truth, what are the consequences? Oh, we can't save them. I'm not saying that. It's not by our might. It's not by our power. No, it's by God's Spirit. But God uses human vessels as witnesses to reach out and to share the truth in love. And I want to make this very care say this very carefully. Again, we're stepping on some very, very controversial territory this evening. And if I came here with the attitude that I'm going to correct everyone, correct the world based on the kinds of information that I'm going to share with you, based on clever argumentation, I'm wrong. The reason that this information has been put together is because God has given me a passion for the truth. But even more than that, a compassion 
for the deceived. And if I were to stand up here tonight and be angry and harsh, and it's easy for that to happen, I'm wrong. Because Jesus, in the book of Revelation, if you remember the church at Ephesus said, hey, you can pick out false teachers, you can pick out false prophets. You're so right, but you're wrong because you don't have any love. And he said, you need to repent. And if you don't repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand or your testimony. So this is so important when we're confronting deception, when we're confronting those that are deceived, that we do so with love. And I've prayed, as I wrote this book, I've prayed tonight before I give this presentation, God, just use me as a vessel to speak to your people. I want to hear from your heart, through my heart, to others. Yet may this be a wake-up call to the church For all those who profess to be Christian, whether they be Protestant or Catholic, and by the way, I can't find Protestant or Catholic in the Bible. And incidentally, there's Protestant error and there's Catholic error. What do I mean by that? There are things that Protestants and Catholics believe can't find him in the Bible. And Protestant error is not any worse than Catholic error, and Catholic error is not any worse than Protestant error. It's error. And I believe that it needs to be corrected because if people don't understand the gospel, they go to hell. That's the issue. And it's also my desire, I, I'm sure there are many here tonight, do not believe or those that may listen to the tape or watch the video, you don't believe. Then my prayer is that you would examine what is being said based on the scriptures and consider the scriptures regarding what's going on, because it will help you to understand. And incidentally, this book is already being translated into Russian, where I was told by the Department of Religious Studies at Pomar University in Archangelus that the book would be effective there and when I asked why, they said, because if what you're saying is right, we're undergoing a paradigm shift, and people don't even know it. Because the trends that are happening in our society are phenomenal. Incidentally, many people don't even know that it's happening. And so I want to reflect the truth of the Word of God with a passion, but at the same time with a compassion for everyone. Those that believe or those that don't believe. Because it's so important that people understand the gospel, the true gospel, so that they won't embrace another gospel. Now, we're going to look at this first major section, which I've called the new wine. The book is called The New Wine in the Babylonian Vine. What do we mean by the new wine? Well, I'm going to give you some references here as we look at various articles and publications. First of all, we look at this Charisma magazine, December 1999. And the major article in the magazine as you can see, the headlines in the front cover states, Fasten your seatbelt. A Christian revival could sweep the world in the next 25 years. And there have been many people that have been talking about this for several decades. Actually, in the 40s, late 40s, and it originated actually from Saskatchewan, where I'm from. There were a group of individuals who claimed that there was a great outpouring that was going to take place. They called it the latter rain. And they foretold that God was raising up a mighty army that was going to be empowered 
that is, Christians empowered as never before, and they were going to be called up as prophets and apostles and generals in this army, and they were going to lead the world to the greatest revival that had ever occurred or would occur. And that movement kind of died out, but it's come back over the last decade or so. And so many people are saying there's this great revival. It's underway. And let me say this. There is a revival underway, a genuine revival, almost everywhere I've traveled. And particularly recently, what I'm observing in Russia, it's phenomenal. And yes, there are people coming to Christ, and there are many coming to Christ in many places, and praise God. So I'm not saying that there's not revival in individual hearts or in individual locations. No, it's happening. But the kind of revival that is being foretold here is that the world is going to come to Christ. The whole world. And many are saying that it can only happen when these empowered Christians lead the way. Let me give you an example this publication called The New Apostolic Churches. And numerous contributors, I will only quote to you one. Pastor Roberts Lairdon in this publication states, the godly leadership that leads these territorial churches has been divinely placed and graced by the Spirit of God. These leaders will restore many truths that have been misplaced or neglected for hundreds of years. Under the godly strength of these leaders and through the eagerness of the church, the kingdom of light will shine on entire cities. Communities and nations, evil atmospheres will change. Cultural and racial conflicts will be subdued and social ills will fade away. This is the kind of revival they're saying. The entire world is going to come to Christ. There's going to be no more evil. And a part of this, they're saying that Jesus can't come until Christianity gets the job done. But again, as I read the scriptures, I find this contradicts the very words of Jesus. Because when he was asked what it would be like, he said, check out history. For in verse 37 of chapter 24 of Matthew, says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For in those days, which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. There were only eight people that were obedient to God, Noah and his family, and the rest were wiped out. Incidentally, Jesus said, as we've already read in Matthew 7, many will be deceived by many, but he made it clear there are two ways to eternity, a wide way. And there are many that are on that path. And there's a narrow way, and he said, I am the way. And this narrow way is through Jesus Christ. So Jesus said that there would be few, not many. He said there would be many that would be deceived, not a few. And he said it would be like it was in Noah's day. And believe me, this is what is happening. On Friday night, I'm going to be speaking at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And the topic's going to be understand the times. And we're going to be dealing with current trends, terrorism, violence, spiritual deception, a movement towards one world religion for the name of Christ for peace. We're going to see there's a whole lot of things that are coming together. And believe me, I don't think the world is getting better. It's getting worse. But in the midst of the darkness, there's light and people are coming to Christ. That's the good news. This Charisma magazine. On the front cover, we have a pastor, Los Angeles pastor, Cheon spreading revival to Asians in America. And I thought this was rather unusual because he's sitting in a yoga position. And this pastor has written this book. It's called Into the Fire. How you can enter renewal and catch God's holy fire. Catch the fire? What is this? Well, it's part of the new wine movement. And I will be explaining some of the phenomena, some of the behavior. And this is what Cheon states on page 22 of his book regarding this particular movement. He says, although many have found this movement controversial, 
I have maintained it is either the biggest deception to hit the church in the history of the church or it is the beginning of a great revival. So you can see there's two positions. He says, he believes that this is part of the great revival and it's controversial because there are others that I take this position that this is part of the great delusion that the Bible talks about that it happens in the name of Christ. And people are caught up in an experience-based form of Christianity. And they're sincere people. Many of them love Jesus. They want to do all they can to serve Jesus, but they're not willing to read his word. And so they're beginning to embrace almost anything and everything in the name of Christ. Incidentally, there are many of these books that are written by various authors that have similar titles. For example, here is The Toronto Blessing, an experience or of renewal and revival, Catch the Fire, by Guy Chevreau. Or a second book that he's written, Share the Fire, The Toronto Blessing and Grace-Based Evangelism. Or a third book, Pray with Fire, Interceding in the Spirit, now, first of all, let me say the Bible talks about fire, the Holy Spirit. But it also talks about strange fire. Here's a book called The Rising Revival. See Peter Wagner, Pablo Dieros, numerous other contributors. And as you can see, there's fire. And the real thing hits Brownsville, Portal and Pensacola by Rene Deloria more fire. From holy laughter to holy fire, America's on the edge of revival. This book called The Visitation, The Brownsville Revival, this is in Pensacola, Florida, author Kathy Wood. And this is a testimony by Kathy Wood regarding her experience, one of her experiences. She went to a meeting and she was prayed for. She said, he got me and the prayer team members to line up against the walls of the back hallway. He went through praying, and in less than four minutes, it was like the St. Valentine's Day massacre back there. Oh, my goodness, I cannot possibly explain, but it was like a bolt of lightning hit me. And I hit the wall and slid down it and shook and jerked uncontrollably for I don't know how long. It took my breath away, and I was taking deep gasps over and over. As each breath came in, my head would jerk to the back. This continued all the way home. I have no idea how I drove. I would start wailing out loud and then just grin a few minutes and then go back wailing. I feel like I was in intercession for loved ones about to attend the revival for the first time. When I walked in the door, my husband thought I'd been accosted in the parking lot or something. I continued jerking in the extreme deep inhaling so much that I had to sleep on the couch. It was an awesome night. I would drift off and awaken with a big jerk. The breathing and the pushing back of my head have continued today, although not to the same degree. Oh, I just love being filled with the Holy Ghost. And this kind of behavior, and I've been to many of their meetings, uncontrollable shaking, twitching, laughing, even animal behavior. And they say God is doing something new. And when you point out that it's not found in the scripture, they say not everything that God does is in the Bible. One of the leaders said, if everything that happened on the day of Pentecost was written in the book of Acts, you would need a wheelbarrow to carry the book of Acts around. So they justify this behavior based on what the Bible does not say rather than what the Bible does say. This book is written by Ken Gott, a British pastor. By the way, this phenomenon has swept the world. It's not just a North American situation. Previous two books that I've written have dealt with the history of this movement. In Toronto, England, United States, worldwide. And this pastor in his book called Anointed or Annoying, talks about his experience. He said, I spent the next one and a half hours on my back under the font of an Anglican church with my Pentecostal friends. 
It was like the Holy Spirit had dropped a bomb in the middle of our circle. Not only were we on our backs, we managed to shed every shred of dignity. We were laughing uncontrollably. We were getting absolutely falling down drunk. One time I looked up to see the baptismal font overhead and I started laughing. I don't even believe in that, I thought. And I laughed all the more. Now here's a pastor who one time taught the Bible, believed in scriptural doctrinal principles. He didn't believe in a baptismal font and now he's laughing because he's in an Anglican church where they had one. He had another experience described in page 78, 79 of his book when he attended a Benny Hinn meeting. He said, I got there first. I took my position in the corner of the platform. My eyes were closed in good Pentecostal fashion, but I could hear Benny Hinn saying to the men as he passed them, take it, take it, take it, take it. And I was thinking, I'm offended, I'm offended, I'm offended, I'm offended, I'm offended. And suddenly everything became quiet for some reason. There wasn't a sound in the place. Then I heard Benny say, young man, I opened my eyes and noticed with a shock that he was looking right at me and standing about 10 yards away. Are you an English pastor, he asked. Yes, I am, I replied. Benny Hinn captured my attention all over again when he said, okay, pick him up again. There were some large, well-built men standing on each side of me, and they moved closer as Benny did exactly what I hoped he wouldn't. He blew right in my face. I was about to get really offended, but Benny's breath just went all over my body, and I fell down again. I got worse. I heard him tell the muscular men towering over me, pick him up again. At this time, I was shaking like a leaf. My hair was on end. I was vibrating under the power of God. He looked right at me and said, young man, from this moment on, you will never be the same again. Take it. And I fell down for the count. What is this it that seems to be transferable? Well, they say it is. Once you get it or receive it, you can give it to others. Well, they say that it's the Holy Spirit. But you will not find any reference to this in the Scriptures. But you can find reference to this in the literature. And in New Wine or Old Deception, I have an entire chapter based upon this book written by Groff and Groff, who are psychotherapists. Christina Groff claims that one time she was a Christian, and then she kind of left Christianity behind because she had an experience with a guru. And she received this gift where she could become a Shaktipat master. Her husband, who was involved in LSD research, also came into this spiritual dimension where he too was able to transfer this so-called experience which they describe in this book on page 78, 79. They say individuals involved in this process might find it difficult to control their behavior during powerful kundalini energy. They often emit various involuntary sounds and their bodies move in strange and unexpected patterns. Among the most common manifestations of this kind are unmotivated and unnatural laughter or crying, talking in tongues, singing previously unknown songs and spiritual chants, assuming yogic postures and gestures, and imitating a variety of animal sounds and movements. And when I first found this book, I was somewhat amazed at the front cover because there it is, the fire. It's another term for this phenomenon, and another term for the phenomenon is called the kundalini. And another term for the kundalini is the serpent power. And the scriptures remind us nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1 verses 9 to 11, that which has been is what will be and what is done is what will be done and there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything in which it may be said, see, this is new, it has already been in ancient times before us? There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the things that are to come by those who will come after. It's very important, if you want to understand the times, is to check out history and see what's happened before. And throughout history, there has been tremendous delusion that has occurred at various times in history. And if you study the ancient cults, you will see that many of them believed that they were on their way to be gods. In Jeremiah chapter 7, in reference to checking out history, 
This is what we read, verses 17 and 20. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood. The fathers kindle a fire. And the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out on this place, on man and on beast, and on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. Now we're moving into another area. I'm just preparing for the second session. There is, in the past, a time when people were following a deity. And she was called the queen of heaven. And Jeremiah points this out that this deity that was being followed by the children of Israel, well, it was an abomination. And it's very important that we consider the scriptures and what the Bible not only has said about the past, but where we're headed to the future. I mentioned earlier, that's what we're told in the New Testament. That we have a more sure word of prophecy, James says. 